I remember at the church I was in, uh, back in Portsmouth when I was at university, they used to have a prayer room in the church building, which was just a room they had set aside for people to go into whenever they wanted and like book a slot and you could go in there to pray. And when you were in that room, what would happen is that you could, you'd like write down the things that you wanted prayer for. You'd write down um, maybe specific people that you wanted to pray for and you'd like stick those things on the walls or hang them from the ceiling. And then the way it kind of worked is that when you went into the prayer room, you'd have a look at the things on the walls, the things that were hanging around, and you would pray prayers that other people had been put in there so that as together, as one community, we could be single minded and focused on the same thing. Now, at the time, I was also running an alpha course with a couple of students attending, and one of those students was called Kieran. And I remember every week he would come back and he would mostly listen. He wouldn't ask that many questions. Um, and I just really felt like I should be praying for him. So I went into this prayer room and I wrote his name down and I just stuck it up on the wall. And over the next few months, I carried on praying for him that he would come to know Jesus. And I know that everyone else in the church family was also praying that he would come to know Jesus. And a few months later, I was actually in that room with Kieran and he gave his life to Jesus in that room. And I was able, had this like wonderful moment where I was able to reach up, pull his name up off the wall and give it to him and say, we as a community have been praying for this moment for months. I tell that story because I think it's a really good example of what happens when the church community, the people that have relationship with God, come together, are single-minded in their focus, in prayer for the lost to come to him. And I think that we see some of this, like why this works in the Bible. I thought I'd just read a passage really quickly from 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 11 to 16 and it says this when Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace the Lord appeared to him at night and said I have heard your prayer and chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifices when I shut up the heavens there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now, my eyes will be open, and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple, so that my name may be there forever, my eyes and heart will always be there. I often read this passage and I think, wow, especially when times are hard, maybe if I just pray a little bit more regularly or if I like repent from my sins, which just means to say sorry for the things you've done wrong. If I, if I do that more often or more regularly or with more discipline, maybe the bad stuff will go away. Maybe bad stuff wouldn't happen. And I put all of this guilt and stuff on my own back, like the state of the world is all my fault because I'm not disciplined enough to pray regularly or to pray the right things or to say sorry enough. And as I think that, and even as I say that, I, I recognise that, that doesn't sound like the kingdom of heaven. That doesn't sound like the relationship I have with God that I read about in the Bible and the one that I know from day to day life. It's not one of condemnation and guilt. It's one of freedom and relationship. And so I, I read this passage and I'm like, well, it says that God is calling people to humble themselves and call on his name and turn from their sin. And that's when he'll bring healing to situations. And I have to think, well, I've already confessed my sins and called on the name of God because I already know him. We're in relationship. So this this part of this passage can't be about me. And I realise as we read in Joel 2 that it says that in those days, the days we live in now, all people will have the Holy Spirit poured out on them. All people will dream dreams and have visions. God is calling all people in this time to his name. This, this first part of the passage when it says to humble ourselves and turn to him isn't actually for the people in the church community who already know him. It's for the rest of the world. He's calling the rest of the world to him. That means that, that my friends and family, your, your course mates, the people you live with, God is calling them by name. To turn to him. And so I think back to this passage again. And I'm, I'm like. Well if I'm not the people that God is calling this passage. Who am I? And I realise that this, this whole bit of scripture. Isn't actually about those people. It's about the temple. 
Solomon has just built the temple and he's consecrated it and he's given it to God. Consecration just means setting it apart um, for God's use. And uh, that's just happened. And then we read this passage. It's a passage about the temple of God. And we know throughout the New Testament, we read again and again and again and again, that when you start a relationship of Jesus, you become like this temple that Solomon had made. You become the place where the spirit of God lives. That when you walk into a room, the spirit of God walks in with you. So it reframes completely how we view this passage. We're not the people that God is calling to come to know him, but rather we are the people that facilitate those new relationships beginning on earth in the same way that the temple facilitated people starting relationship and communication with God. So I come back to that original question, especially when things are hard. What is my role? What am I meant to do? And I think this passage tells us. First thing we read in in verse 15 is that God's eyes are open and his ears are attentive to every prayer offered in the temple, especially in times of hardship. Now, if, if we, the church together, are the temple of God, that means that especially when you're in a rough season, God is waiting for you and for the rest of the church community to cry out on behalf of what's happening. He's eagerly waiting to hear from us. He's waiting to hear us pray. So that means maybe if you're in a tough season at the moment, maybe you look at the world around you and you're like, things are really rough. The way that the church family should respond, the way if you know Jesus, you should be responding, is to pray and call out to him and facilitate God coming and making a difference on earth as his temple. The second thing that I think we read is in verse 16, it says, I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. Consecration or or the act of making something holy just means, as I said, to set something apart for God's use. In fact, the word holiness originally just means um, to be different, essentially, to be different to the things of this world. So if God is consecrating the temple to be different, what in the season you're in right now does it mean to be different to what you see around you? Maybe if around you you see apathy, it's time to step up and be an activist. Maybe if around you you just see fear, now is the time to step up and be bold. Maybe if all you see is hate and ignorance, now is the time to step up and love and be consecrated as the temple of God. And so I just think it's worth asking a couple of questions as we think about this passage. If the desire of God, as we read in the first half, is that the people he is calling, the whole world, turn to him, say sorry for all the wrong things they've done, humble themselves, call out on his name. If that is his desire and our job as the temple is to facilitate the beginning of that relationship, what do we need to do? And if we're meant to be praying, who is it that we need to be calling out on behalf of? Who do you know in your lives? Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a course mate. Maybe it's even someone you live with. Maybe it's even someone else in the room who doesn't know Jesus yet. Who could you be chatting to Jesus about on their behalf? And the second question is this. What does it look like to be holy in this season? In the season you find yourself in now, what does it look like to be different and set apart to what you see in the world right now? And that might change season on season. It might change depending on the house you're in. But what does it look like to be recognised and marked as someone who lives for Jesus, as the temple of God, because you can be seen as looking different to what you see around you? I'm going to pray real quick and then give you some time to chat about those questions. Father God, I thank you that you have chosen us to be the place where you facilitate meeting new people on this planet, on earth, in our communities, in our church. God, I pray that you give us the passion to pray for the people around us who don't know you yet. God, we we don't want those people to unwillingly come to know you, Father, but rather you would gently call them towards you as you always have done. 
We pray, Father, that everyone we know and love who doesn't know you yet will find relationship with you that is freeing, that is loving, that knows no end or limit. And God, I pray that each of us in this room now, God, that you could show us what it means to be holy and consecrated in this season. Show us what it looks like to act like a disciple, to act like someone who's part of your family. In your name. Amen.